This is video seven in my Revelation summary. And we're going to start on this chart because this is the uh, end result, basically, of four years of work I've done on the New Testament, looking up cross-references and quotes. I've gone through the whole New Testament, looked up everything that quotes back to the Old or cross-references back to the Old Testament. So that as we go through the New Testament, to put it in context, and uh, the important thing is the context comes from looking up what those quotes go back to and what's taught back in a lot of it's in Isaiah and Jeremiah and so forth, Zechariah and Psalms. But uh, as you go through the New Testament as well, what I've discovered is that all the stuff uh, that connects the 12 tribes to the New Testament also cross-references back and forth to each other. Everything on this chart connects to everything else in one way or the other. And it's, like, it's kind of like a spider web. It's hard to show any other way, so I decided to just break it down more into a topical format. So what I've got here, uh, Kingdom of God, these are kind of the terms I'm using up here at the top. Kingdom of God, formed in the womb is the important thing in Isaiah. Uh, the people who follow God's law, Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. Uh, in other words, everything that refers back to those chosen, the elect people, uh, choose, so I'm looking at various words, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham and his heir, which is Christ, uh, children of Israel, house of Jacob, house of David, house of Israel, house of Judah, 12 tribes, redeemed, redeemed, and redemption. Now, just do it like that. So, KOG, Kingdom of God, or Kingdom of Heaven, both of those terms are used. There's 138 verses that refer to the Kingdom of God in uh, the New Testament. And the ones, what I've done there, is I've, the ones I've highlighted in pink are the most, really the most important. And if I've circled them as well, then those are the key verses about who uh, is in the Kingdom of God, who's worthy for that. In other words... But like I say, all these verses, as you're going along uh, in your cross-reference Bible, you'll see that if you're on one of these verses, it'll cross-reference to another one or uh, Father uh, on up in Acts or Romans or whatever, but they all cross-reference back and forth. And they'll also cross-reference to the redeemed, or they'll cross-reference down to follow God's law, or they'll cross-reference to one of the others, but they'll all cross-reference to each other back and forth. Now my second uh, group here. The key uh, thing that's important about this is Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. If you look at Luke 24, 44, and you see that connects to Acts uh, 1, 3 there, I think that is. You'll notice that in the last 40 days when Christ was on earth, that's when he was actually teaching the apostles everything about himself in Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. Now there are a lot of verses that mention uh, something was in Moses or something it could be found in the prophets or something could be uh, found in Psalms. But that was the only verse that actually uses all three of those terms in one verse is Luke 24, 44. So that last 40 days is really when Christ uh, started teaching them about the second coming of Christ because up to that time, they thought the kingdom of God was going to commence immediately. They didn't understand that he was going to come, be crucified, leave, and then come back 2,000 years later. They had no concept. And the other problem with that is most of the quotes you see in the New Testament that talk about Christ are actually about the second coming, not the first coming. Uh, sometimes it's kind of weird, and we'll look through some of these. It's actually a quote where you've got a mention of Christ. Uh, coming the first time within a prophecy of him coming the second time, which can be very confusing to people that uh, study the scripture, which is why I'm trying to tie this together and make a, a good study guide out of this, because you can learn a lot by connecting the dots, and I've spent a lot of time doing this chart here, so you can understand that the New Testament is about the same people as the Old Testament. There's no change in context of different people in the New Testament. Now there are all the terms that would connect uh, 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, house of Israel, house of Judah, children of Israel, men of Israel, house of David, house of Jacob, and Israelite or Israelites. I have to squeeze that in there. And actually that word Israelite is important, even though it's not used a whole lot. It's actually not used much in scripture at all. Now, the chose, chosen or the elect, I went ahead and went back uh, to Deuteronomy on that so you could see the uh, background. That's also not used uh, that much. Now, the redeemed people are pretty uh, important. And I start with Genesis on that. Because uh, Abraham was redeemed, that's a, a verse in scripture. Jacob's redeemed, and Isaac, of course. And they were the only ones promised redemption, and their offspring promised redemption forever. See that in 2 Samuel. So those are some pretty important, and of course their offspring was the standard. That's another thing that we'll see when we get to these uh, charts of the prophets. There's a lot of teaching about the Israel people being the standard which others will be judged by. So that's the whole concept of being an Israelite. They are going to be the administrators of God's law. That's, that's about what it boils down to. They're going to follow his law, be administrators of his law in the kingdom. And there's, uh, interestingly enough, 224 verses that indicate in the New Testament that these chosen, these elect, these people, the 12 tribes, whatever, are uh, need, need to, I should say, follow God's law to be found worthy. So there's no idea in the New Testament that uh, God's law is done away with. His ordinances were done away with. So we don't need to sacrifice animals. But he says specifically that his, he did, was, didn't come to do away with his law. And of course that wouldn't make any sense. You can't administrate his law if there is no law to administrate. Now, here's my chart. That'll work. New Testament in context. Now, this is kind of what it's going to look like as we go along. I'll end up with some showing how some cross references uh, connect. And uh, I kind of started with uh, Matthew 1 1 on that design, but I probably won't stick with that. But uh, at least this will kind of give you an overall what I'm doing <coughs> when I'm looking these up as we go th through the New Testament. When you look up uh, Matthew 1 1, uh, you have Christ the son of David and the son of Abraham, basically. It says both, but you have a lot of cross-references for Christ the son of David. All your pastors teach Christ the son of David. However, they don't teach Christ the son of Abraham as Abraham knew about Christ being his redeemer or was promised that uh, redeemer, uh, Messiah or Christ. Either way, they don't teach that. And one of the reasons I don't think they teach it is because Galatians 3.16 you go over there, it says, okay, uh, to my seed, to thy seed, which is Christ, in that uh, he's talking about Abraham having uh, an offspring, which would be Christ, or an heir, and that also goes to Hebrews uh, 2.16 and 17, which you see just below. He descended upon the heir of Abraham, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Abraham knew that. However, there is, this is a verse that does indicate Abraham knew about uh that he was promised, in other words, Christ, or promised the Messiah. And the problem is, that's not in any of the cross-reference Bibles that I, that I found. So I started looking through uh, Genesis again, and it took me quite a while, but I did find it. At any rate, let's look at how these uh, do cross-reference, if you have a cross-reference Bible. Now, all these cross-reference Bibles are not the same. They don't all use the same verses. And frankly, some of them are just wrong. The verse is not the proper context of what it's trying to quote. Or they don't have the quote, even though uh, it appears that there should be a quote. Sometimes they don't know uh, which verse because the wording in, uh, it'll say something that appears to be a, a, maybe a direct quote, but the wording actually in scripture is different. So, uh, which is what we're going to see here. Now, some, uh, one of my cross-reference Bibles, I have a, these three good ones, uh, went to Genesis 21, 12, 
where it says, For in Isaac shall the, thy heir be called, which that could be talking about Christ, but I don't think it is. However, I do think that, uh, like I show on the first line there, uh, Genesis 22, 18, 26, 4, and 28, 14 could all be talking about Christ. However, there's a, more, there's a better verse than that. Now, uh, if you'll see Hebrews 2.16 crosses to Hebrews 5.5 5 and 6. You are my son, an eternal priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And that crosses to Psalms 110.4. Forever you shall be a priest of the order of Melchizedek. And that crosses to Genesis 14, 18, which is the first mention of Melchizedek. And that was on our other chart, the rock was Christ. And you see that Abraham brought, or Melchizedek, brought forth bread and wine. In other words, he held communion with Abraham. He was the priest of the Most High God, uh, uh, king of righteousness, actually, is uh, the important part. And Abraham gave him tithes. So why did Abraham think to give uh, Melchizedek tithes and have communion with him if uh, he had no idea of who he was or that he was connected to uh, the Messiah or the idea of a Redeemer? I, I think he did know because even by the time you get to Genesis 14, 18, well, he's already uh, gone out and... He's bringing back uh, Lot, rescued Lot, in other words. In fact, what he's doing is carrying out the uh, justice. He was told to create a justice system, and we're going to see that. And you can't create a justice system unless you create it on God's law. So Abraham already knew God's law, and he was actually uh, creating a justice system. He got some men, went out, and did what he was told to do. So he was following God's law at that time. That's the point. Now, Genesis 15, I had to really search to find that, actually, in a quote, but I did find it. <coughs> and we'll see that on the next chart. We're going to flip over there because this thing's here in the Abrahamic covenant, which have not been taught. And this Genesis 15, 1, I think, is one of the most important. This is Christ speaking. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. This is the third manifestation of Christ, the shield, the stone, and the scepter. Now, everyone knows about the scepter. All pastors teach that. Not so many on the stone or the rock, but I've had, I, we just did the chart. The rock was Christ. <coughs> so you can see how many times it talks about the rock. And there are a lot of cross-references from the rock to the shield. So that's going to be uh, something important that is going to manifest here in the Abrahamic Covenant. It's going to explain a lot of things that no one seems to have ever covered, I don't think. Now, Genesis 49-24 is the other mention of the guardian stone or the stone or rock, either way. And then there are your cross-references that go to that. I put that in there because that crosses from these other verses. So all these cross-references in, in, in some of your cross-reference Bibles, you'll find these connections. And then you'll see Genesis goes to Ephesians 1, and I put 4 to 23. He chose us before the foundation of the world, speaking of the 12 tribes or the chosen people from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Predestinated us. We have redemption. We have obtained an inheritance, which he affected in Christ, in other words. All right, and I think he did affect it in Christ in Genesis 15, 1. That's what he was talking about. He was going to redeem Abraham's offspring, because this was all foreordained. 1 Peter 1.20, Christ foreordained before the foundation of the world, which also goes to Ephesians 3, 9, and 11. So I think uh, as we lay this out, what we're going to see, and I'm going to switch to the next chart, is that uh, the New Testament, in reality, is just partial fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, I never uh, necessarily understood that idea before and still started going through the Abrahamic Covenant looking for uh, this connection back to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And then I realized that uh, through other things, looking through how everything crosses back and forth, 
I realized that there's things here that I've never heard about before. There's also some context that pe uh, pastors typically teach, uh, everyone I've ever heard of, teach that's absolutely wrong in the New Testament that needs to be corrected and understood. So let's just start. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 connects. Uh, there's a lot of cross-references in the New Testament that connect back to that. It says, leave your country, your kindred, and your father's household. Go to a land I will show you. I, and that's Christ basically speaking from uh, the idea of the rock was Christ. I've already laid out. I will make you a great Christian nation. Now, there's no logic of God or Christ. We, we can say it either way. There's no logic of God making Abraham into a great nation and a multitude of nations. Because if you look, it says uh, 17, 4, many or multitude of nations, 35, 11 is a nation and a commonwealth or a company of nations. And then 48, 19 is also a nation and a multitude. But all those cross reference to Exodus 19, 6, which everyone knows, which are kingdom priests and a holy nation. You can't be a holy nation if you don't worship Christ. It's impossible. And all those keep right on going through Deuteronomy. And of course, uh, Hebrews 8, 8, 1 Peter, all these are connected. So obviously it's talking about people who know the Messiah and teach the message of Christ. So what's the logic then of this uh, prophecy that he would make uh, Abraham's offspring into a great nation and a multitude of nations and none of those nations uh, know Christ or were prophesied from the beginning to know Christ. Well, of course they were. He was promise, promising Abraham his offspring to be made into these nations, these kings who would know Christ, carry out his law. That was the whole idea from the very beginning. They were to be administrators of God's law. That's what the whole Bible was about. Kingdom priests. And then, of course, in Revelation 14:6. All the way to the end, the righteous are the blessed who follow God's law. There's no change in context from the beginning. Genesis all the way to the end in Revelation. Same group of people. Same thing. Nothing changed. I will bless you and make your name distinguished, and you will be a benefactor. In other words, uh, dispensing good to other nations. Now, Let's carry that thought on to the next. I will bless those who bless you or benefit you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. That's also re reinstated or restated in 2729. In Exodus uh, 23, angel to guard and guide you. Of course, he's talking about Christ. In Numbers uh, 24, Christ the exalted king, talking about the scepter will crush your adversaries. That's the idea of the rock. Guard you like a lion, which is the lion of Judah in Genesis 49.10. So all that connects. Uh, the important thing is the shield uh, and the stone and the scepter are kind of three different things. Rock is when he actually works for you to crush your adversaries. The shield is when he uh, just guards you to keep keeps you from being uh, harmed, in other words, not necessarily attacking for you, uh, crushing adversaries, but guarding you from being hurt. And then the scepter is uh, when he's the king, the righteous king. So <clears throat> the idea will be manifested here. Look at the next sentence. In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed, the source of the blessing is Christ, the heir of Abraham, that we just pointed out in Galatians 3.16, Hebrews. In other words, the idea of Christ is that he would redeem the 12 kindred tribes and bless those who follow God's law. That's what the text all the way through the Bible indicates. And I say that the first verse that kind of indicates that as well as 22.18, in your seed or your heir, which is Christ, uh, that would be the first verse that would refer back to uh, the Messiah or Christ. And then Deuteronomy, that's why we have the blessing, the curses, same idea. You follow his law, that's where your blessings come from. But you also have to have faith in Christ for those uh, blessings to manifest. Now in Acts, 
Here's what kind of corrects us. If you see in, if you were in Galatians, you notice that in Galatians 3, 18 and 14, it uses the word Gentiles. And this is the big problem with the New Testament. They translated this, transliterated, I should say, this word Gentiles and Jew or Jews in the New Testament. And the problem with that is the Gentiles doesn't just have a singular meaning and neither does Jews as well. Now I've got a couple other videos. Here's an important point. If you look up the word uh, Jew, you'll notice that it's used as the tribe of Judah as a Jehudite, in other words, as a racial term. But then in context in the New Testament in the scripture, it's also applied to the house of Judah. So then, instead of just being the tribe of Judah, now it's included Judah, Levi, and part of Benjamin. So there's two different contexts uh, of the Jew, even though you could say those were racial. However, those aren't the, the real terms in far as the context of how the New Testament plays out. It's not actually going to play out as applying to Judah, Levi, or Benjamin. In, this, in the third uh, use of the term Jew, it's used as a Judean which is really someone who lives in Judea, which could and actually did include some Edomite priests who were appointed by Herod. They were called Jews. And that's really the correct definition of the term. Uh, and then you see it used as Judaism, someone who practices the religion. So in other words, if they were a Judean, that's a geographical term. If they practice Judaism, that's a religious term. And if they were a proselyte or a, Ju a Judaizer, someone who practices the religion of the Jews, which could be either from birth, uh, family, or, or tradition, or they've been converted to Judaism from another religion, such as the K uh, Khazars were, which are, we call Ashkenazi Jews. So one word, the problem is one word can't possibly contain all these different people. And if you use it that way, then any of the racial me meaning is automatically null and void. Because if you're using it as a religious term, it can't be racial. If you're using it geographical, you can't just say, well, it belongs to one group of people, which is Judah, but then say, well, these other people who converted to Judaism are Jews as well. You can't use it in four different terms like that. So when pastors use it, they try to use it as one uh, terminology but it actually means different things. As we go through the New Testament, you're going to see how it's actually used, and uh, mostly it's not as a racial term. So, here's the other problem. Gentiles, same thing. If you start looking up how Gentiles is used in the New Testament, it's actually used more to mean the house of Israel, which were the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And even Christ himself used it that way. So, the point is, back here, they all refer back here to Genesis in this section where it says, In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, people teach that to mean that the offspring of the 12 tribes, uh, or the offspring of Abraham, which are the 12 tribes in other words, will be a blessing to other people on earth. But that's not the context of what it's actually saying. The source of the blessing is Christ. In other words, Christ... In Christ shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. That's in Acts. That's the correct context. Acts 3.25. Over there, it got it right. Talking about the 12 tribes and their blessing is the fact that they'll get redemption from Christ. The kindreds of the earth, of course, are the 12 kindred tribes. That's the proper context. And you're going to see that as we go through the Abrahamic covenant. That actually plays out many times. So... I started on this, I just realized that I'm going to have to connect the dots on this, otherwise people just aren't going to get it. They're going to believe what they've been told instead of what, they, uh, what the Bible actually says here. Let's move down. Okay, 13, 14 and 16, I will give this land to you and your posterity forever. And uh, in other words, make them as the dust of the earth where they can't be counted. And then it also refers to that. If I don't, again, if I don't say, if I don't state what book it is, it's in the same book. So 15.5 is in Genesis. All the ones in blue are Genesis. And then uh, 
I highlight the other books without the verses so you can kind of just glance at it and, and tell. Now what I was saying before 1414, yeah there's 318 youths or servants of Abraham's household which were trained for war. In other words that's the first militia or army created to enforce God's law which is justice and judgment repeated a hundred times in scripture. That also goes to Exodus 18, 19, and 23, which is where Moses set up uh, the justice system. Actually, he did that before he gave them the law, of course. The justice system had to be based on God's law. Ideas also repeated in Genesis 18, 19, which we'll get to, and then in 1 Kings. Now, 14, 18, and 19 is where I say Abraham had communion with Christ, or Melchizedek, refers to Psalms 110.4 and Hebrews 5.10 and 7.1. Blessed be Abraham by Yahweh, in other words, through Christ. Verse 20, blessed be Yahweh who delivered your enemies into your hand by Christ the rock, in other words. Abraham gave Christ tithes of the spoil. And then there's your other cross references. So, I think, uh, as I stated on the rock of Christ, that when you get to 15.1 then, this uh, idea of the shield is in fact Christ or the Messiah speaking to him, or even if it's God uh, speaking to him, uh, typically it's God speaking through Christ. I don't uh, believe from anything I've seen in scripture that people ever saw the face of God. They might have heard his voice, obviously but not necessarily his face. If they did see a face, it was usually Christ that they were looking at, the manifestation, or an angel. Okay, so in 15.1 then, I am your shield, I would say that's the Messiah, Christ, and your exceeding great reward is redemption through Christ, which also goes uh, up to 26.3, I will shield you and bless you, same idea. 28.15, I'll guard you or protect you always. And then Deuteronomy, blessed Israel, who is like you, a victor race for Christ, your shield, your helper, the sword that exalts you. So here you have the idea of the shield, the scepter, in other words, and uh, the rock. You will grow and subdue your enemies and advance on their hills, which hills from Revelation when they were government. So you'll advance on other governments like a road, in other words, conquer other governments, and he will help you. Now, there's actually a cross-reference here in 2 Samuel 22 that was uh, used on the rock was Christ, which also connects to the shield. So, you'll notice verse 2, Christ is my rock, fortress, and deliverer. Verse 3, Yahweh is my rock, whom I trust, my shield, horn of salvation, my guardian and protector. So there you go. The shield, the rock, the scepter, all in one. And that uh, cross-references back to verse 15.1. So there is a cross-reference to the shield as Christ. And in the text, you'll see there are a bunch of connections. Christ is a shield, verse 31, to all who trust in him. 32, who is Yahweh except Christ our rock? Verse 36, Christ is the shield of my salvation. Blessed and exalted is my rock of salvation by Yahweh. 51, Christ is my tower of salvation and shows unfailing loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his posterity forever. And then in Psalms, you have basically the same thing that you had here in 2 Samuel. That's why I just say same. The verses in Psalms, uh, which you can see there, refer to the shield, the redeemer. Uh, Fortress, same idea. I won't read those, but uh, we've got them on the rock of Christ. Then in Proverbs, Christ is a shield to those that trust and take refuge in him. Isaiah 41, 1 through 6, train, Christ will be a shield to his chosen 12 kindred tribes, in other words, and Redeemer. All who war against you are destroyed. So that's the idea of the rock. So shield you from harm. And then he'll fight for you, in other words. <coughs> Ephesians 6, 11 through 17. 
put on the complete armor of God, the shield of faith. Well, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and word of God. Of course, uh, Christ uh, is the word of God. In other words, uh, here it's all talking about Christ, the shield. And we've all taught that. But, and you can read that, but the who, who's to put on the armor of God, is back in Ephesians 1, 4 through 14, verse 4. He had chosen us for himself before the foundation of the world, predestinated us. So, the who to put on the shield is the 12 kindred tribes. It tells you the people who were chosen, who were predestinated, cannot be anyone except the 12 tribes, okay? He gave us a gift through love, redemption, through his blood. That was the gift he gave to the 12 tribes all through the Bible. It never changes context. Making known to us only the mystery of his kingdom. That's in Matthew 13, 11. To be fulfilled in the end time, those elected and predestinated to obtain an inheritance in Christ, you were sealed with the promise by his spirit, which is the pledge of our inheritance to be redeemed by the possession of it as proof of his honor. That's the best way I can state it. And that refers to Romans 8, 28, 33. Those called God's chosen who love Christ, God foreknew and predestined to be appointed to conformity with the image of Christ. That he might be the firstborn among the brethren whom he predestined he called, made righteous, and distinguished. Again, 12 tribes, and that goes up to Romans 9, 2 through 5. My brethren, my kindred by race, that's Paul speaking, who are the 12 tribes, who are given the covenants of the law giving, justice and judgment, in other words. Oops. Scroll down. Second bit more. Probably went quite ways beyond. These charts are on my site. You can download them. Uh, they're right on the front page. Uh, print them out in 11 by 17. Uh, hard stock is the easiest. And a whole uh, set. Uh, I've, last one I did was about $12. So all these charts are broken in half the top half, the bottom half. You print them out in 11 by 17. You can read them uh, fairly easy. If you try to make them smaller, uh, they don't read so well. But it's uh, reasonably cheap. It's kind of hard just looking at them in, on your computer. Printing them out in 11 by 17 is the way to go. And then uh, it's a lot better because you can uh, flip through them. Uh, I've got the important things highlighted, so it makes it a lot easier to use them uh, if they're printed out. Uh, that looks good. Okay, so... Ephesians, then we were down to Romans uh, 9.25. <clears throat> My kindred by race are the twelve tribes, given the covenants, justice and judgment, the temple service and the promises, whom came the patriarchs, who we trace the genealogy of Christ. So it can't be talking about anyone except the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which uh, we trace the genealogy of Christ from, which is where we started in the New Testament, who is supreme over all. He can't separate that and say that that Matthew, uh, beginning of Matthew is supposed to be talking about someone else who fits the bill. There's only one group of people who fit this, and that's the context of the New Testament. Then 11, 2, through five, or 2 and 5, God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew there's a remnant chosen by grace. And then that remnant is 1 Peter 2, 9, living stones, and we've been through that. And of course, then that goes to Revelation chapter 14 and 12 through uh, 12, 17. So, there is no way to, to disconnect all these verses from each other. If people do that, then they're not, uh, they're not teaching scripture. I don't know what they're doing. You have to put scripture in the context, or you can teach anything you want with it. If you don't look up the, the cross references and don't teach them, and put it into your teaching, you, you could teach a lot of things. If you don't have to look up the cross-references and show people what it means. Now, there's an interesting thing. A lot of people say, well, that, 
you know, that's a bigoted that uh, means that other people can't have salvation and so on. Eh, I should have messed up. I messed up here. I should have gone ahead and picked over this. But, no, I don't uh, think that the Bible teaches that. I think it just dwells on the 12 tribes. It does teach about other people. Now, here's a good one. I like to uh, send people to is Isaiah. Uh, oops. I thought that was. Well, I guess that's right. Isaiah 56 6 is talking about men. It says, And men of foreign birth who join the Lord and serve and love his living name shall be to him for sons, I mean, to be to Christ, for, or to God, for sons, who keep his rest unbroken and hold his treaty firm, they shall reach my sacred hill, that's talking about New Jerusalem, because this is end time, join in my house of prayer, and there upon my altar their gifts and offering place. Well, that uh, goes back to Zechariah 14, 16. the house of prayer shall be called for every tribe. And thus, when uh, the great Lord says, when lost Israel I collect, it's talking about the lost sheep of the house of Israel, I will collect with them beyond him my select. <clears throat> so right there in uh, Isaiah 56, 6 through 8, he kind of indicates that there are men of foreign birth, uh, people who uh, basically follow his law, keep his covenant, do the things that uh, would make them worthy, he will also select other people. Uh, I realize that there's an idea of salvation only being to uh, Israel, and that's taught all throughout Scripture. But then there are some other verses that indicate uh, that he also chooses other people. So apparently he will give salvation to other people who follow his law, who love uh, Christ, teach the message of Christ, and so on. It, uh, However, the whole idea about the 12 tribes, these people who were predestinated, they were going to run the justice system. That's the idea. If they're going to govern with an iron rod, that means they're going to be uh, the ones who he chose to be specifically, uh, like a, a judge, for example. If you're chosen to be a judge, uh, other people don't get uh, irate about that because you're the judge and they're not. So that's what he chose them for. He chose them to understand his law and to uh, institute the justice system based on his law. They'll understand it and they'll uh, run the justice system. That's the key thing. That's what keeps everybody, uh, that's the whole idea of love is when you uphold his law correctly, which is what you're being judged for actually, is not upholding a proper justice system. And we're going to see that uh, mentioned many times. <clears throat> Let's go on. 15, 4 through 7. Now he's talking about uh, Isaac, in other words. Uh, he's telling Abraham, You will produce an heir from your loins. Your posterity will be as the stars of the sky. You will inherit this land. Abraham believed Christ, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, everybody uh, points to that. However, this uh, is not an unconditional covenant at this point. Uh, yes, uh, he was... Uh, credit to him for righteousness, but at this point in time, his, he was not under a uh, unconditional covenant. This was actually a conditional covenant. This is going to manifest as we go along, and you see how this all connects and connects back to the, what it says in the New Testament. <clears throat> all right, 15, 9 through 18, Abraham made, made a burnt offering. By the way, the word burnt offering is holocaust. And it's kind of odd that people use this term uh, to mean uh, people uh, killed in war, in a sense, when it really means a burnt offering to, uh, to God or to Christ, however you want to look at it. Uh, if you look in the Catholic Dere Reims Bible, they always use the word holocaust, and I guess they always have. They don't actually use the term burnt offering. But in King James, if you look that up, you'll find that it goes back to the word holocaust. Now, that uh, crosses to Exodus 18.12, Leviticus 
saw a prophetic vision that his posterity would be in bondage in Egypt for 400 years, then delivered by Christ with great wealth. I will give this country to your posterity. That's also in Psalms 105. All right, 16, 7 to 14. Christ spoke to Hagar at the well of the vision of life. So in other words, uh, the offspring to increase without number was also given to her offspring, the uh, Ishmaelites. In other words, this well of the vision of life, vision of life, I think it was a, a vision of Christ, in other words. So that's why I said Christ spoke to her. All right, 17, 1 through 8 is, that's Abraham at 99 years old, in other words. Walk before me and be perfect. Now that idea, walk before me and be perfect, is mean to follow God's law, because that goes to 18, 19, command your posterity and household to follow God's law and set up a justice and judgment. And the only way you can have a proper justice system is through God's law, okay? So that the promises will come into effect. So in other words, if you do what I tell you to do, the promises will come into effect. That was the idea. And then again, that goes to Exodus 18, 19 uh, through 23, where it says, Select the most righteous men to appoint as judges to establish a proper justice system so the 12 tribes can live in peace. Okay. 1 Kings 2, 3, and 4, keep his statutes, commandments, judgments, and ordinances as written in the law of Moses so you may prosper in all you do, and Christ will keep his promise to me. So, the idea, in other words, uh, yes, the 12 tribes will still be uh, redeemed at the end, but they're still being uh, punished for not following his law, even today. It's kind of a paradox that you can be uh, helped and punished at the same time, but that's kind of what's uh, going on. Uh, Alright, so Exodus 6, 2, and 3, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob as Yahweh, but, not by, but by my redemptive name, Messiah, or Christ, I was not known to them. So, that's why it says... Uh, God uses the word God when maybe it's actually Christ speaking or the Messiah speaking in Genesis, for example. I, I say if it's Christ, it's just uh, nothing wrong with pointing out the context. I will make a covenant with you and increase your offspring exceedingly. Abraham means father of many nations and they're nations of colonizers who teach Christ. So they go in and colonize. And they teach uh, Christ and they base their justice system on God's law. <clears throat> and that's the uh, commonwealth in 35, 11, and 12, for example. Nations and kings, or kingdoms, as in Christian nations or lamb kingdoms, in other words. And that refers to Revelation 11, 3, and 13, 11. Will come from your posterity, everlasting, and I will be their God, and they will inherit the promised land for an everlasting possession. And then there, the word there is talking about the 12 tribes. And that's Exodus 3, 6, 19, 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and Revelation. So the context is the 12 tribes, in other words. That's who he's talking to. All right, let's uh, move this over. All right, 17, 9 through 14, Abraham and your posterity are to keep covenant, or in other words, the law of circumcision, including servants or slaves in your household for everlasting. So here he told him again, there's another covenant of uh, circumcision that's to uh, last forever. And even the people who are in your household, who are not your family, are supposed to go to it. Uh, all not willing are to be separated from the body, and that's the body of believers, of course, uh, as Yahweh or Christ uh, commanded. So that refers to Romans, Luke's uh, 2.21, for example. 
Now, 17, 15, and 21, Sarah, or Sarah, has changed to uh, blessed as the mother of nations, kings, or kingdoms, at 90 years of age. And she's these kings or kingdoms, of course, are the 12 kindred tribes, which are Christian people. And then see the cross references on Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 3, where we started. Now, uh, Galatians uh, 4, 28, it also is the cross reference Her heirs according to the promise, which is the same people in Revelation 12, 17. My everlasting covenant will pass to Isaac and his posterity. So, 18, 10 through 4, I'll restore you, uh, speaking of Abraham and Sarah, to a period of youth. Sarah will bear Isaac. And the word Isaac means laughter, and then that's repeated. So he gave him twice, I uh, gave him this idea that he would restore them to a period of youth. That's actually what he did. I think he restored them uh, probably 55 years of age. He brought them back in time so that they could have children because Abraham was 100 years old. She was 90. There was no way to have children at that age and to uh, uh, breastfeed your child and all that at that age there was no way he said he restored him to a period of youth and there's a reason there's a really good reason i think he did exactly that now i'm guessing 55 years and that's in my main videos if you watch it now 18 18 19 the posterity of abraham to become a great and mighty christian nation and all the nations of the earth the 12 christian kindred tribes shall be blessed in him because they inherited the righteousness of his faith in Christ. And that refers to Galatians 3.29. If you belong to Christ, then you are of Abraham's race, heirs according to the promise. Uh, 4.28 and 29. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children according to the promise. And by the power of the Spirit of Christ. And then Hebrews 9.15, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called for internal inheritance might receive the promise. So those all connect to tell you that it's talking about the 12 tribes. I have instructed him that if, Abraham, we're still in chapter 18, I have instructed him then that if Abraham will follow God's law, in other words, that's conditional, and teach his posterity to do the same as well as his household and set up a proper justice system to carry out judgment on those who don't, then, then I will fulfill my promise to him. So that's a conditional covenant. So here in 18, we get the idea that Abraham was supposed to follow God's law teach his offspring to do the same, including his household, set up a justice system based on God's law, which is why I say he had it way back there in chapter 14. Now, 18, 23, let's... Uh, I've got probably half, well, let's go a little bit further. I don't think I've got quite halfway through. There's a couple of good points here. 1823 to 25, Abraham understands Christ is the judge of the whole earth and intends to destroy the wicked in Sodom after commanding him to set up a justice system and do the same. Christ sets the example by saving the righteous and destroying the wicked. See? Cries or shrieks came from Lot's house, more than likely, and or his relatives, and that refers to Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, Luke, Peter, and also Genesis nineteen twenty-four. So uh, the idea was is that uh, Abraham is probably uh, more than likely talking to this angel, which is Christ or the Messiah, and he's going to go over there and judge Sodom. So he's basically giving an example of what Abraham's supposed to be doing as far as a justice system. Now, if we look at chapter 20, why would King Abimelech 
take Sarah for a wife if she looked her natural age of 90 years old. <laughs> Here's my point. It said that he uh, restored them to youth, and then the next thing you read is that the Ambimelech, uh, they're over in this land, and he, uh, the king takes Sarah, which he intends to may maybe make a wife out of her. Well, if she was 90 years of age, why would Ambimelech want, regardless of what she looks like, if she's 90 years old, he would be a laughing stock to take a woman of that age for as a wife. Obviously, he can't have offspring with a 90-year-old woman, and that's just crazy. So the prophecy of 18, 10 through 4, has been fulfilled by that time, which is I'm saying is probably, if you look at the time frame, it's probably only within about uh, three months or something like that. Their ages have been turned back approximately 55 years within three months. Abraham's called a great teacher or prophet, depending on your, on your Bible, as he teaches God's law to his household, which he was commanded to do, and its application within a community. He's already set up this uh, group of men as an army. He's already been out, uh, rescued Lot, and basically been helped by uh, Christ, shielded and so forth. So he's been relating prophecies to people about his future son, about Isaac, during this time. He's already probably obviously told them that. They've asked him, they've seen that his he's been restored to youth and that Sarah's been restored to, to youth. So they've actually seen this happen, okay? So uh, he's related this prophecy about his future offspring, the 12 tribes in Egypt, the Christian nations and kingdoms to come from him, him who Christ will distinguish as the future kingdom priest in the New Testament. So he's told them about his offspring who are gonna, uh, be great in the future, okay? And he's taught, taught, taught them about uh, New Jerusalem as well, that future heavenly city with the foundations and gates displaying the names of the 12 tribes, 12 apostles, whose architect and builder is Yahweh. If all that seems too fantastic, and keep in mind his household witnessed their restoration to a younger age and the birth of Isaac uh, nine months later. They may have actually seen Christ speaking with Abraham when he was there, and they saw how he was exceedingly blessed in everything he did. His, uh, a lot of animals and other things, and a lot of members of his household, a lot of servants, okay? Abraham was given even more male and female servants for his household, along with sheep and oxen from Abimelech. So, Christ uh, actually intervened, or God, however you want to look at it. Uh, Abimelech had a dream and told, was told not to touch her. But the fact is, he, if she was 90, he wouldn't have anything uh, to do with them. So, in 20, uh, I kind of, I guess I need to fix that. In 21, one, I guess, Sarah suckled Isaac. In other words, he breastfed, she breastfed her son. And that refers back to Hebrews, where it's also mentioned there. Now, 21, 12, from Isaac, I will nominate an heir. And that uh, goes to Romans and Galatians and Hebrews to inherit the promises made to Abraham. So uh, I don't think uh, obviously that uh, would be talking about Christ. That would be uh, an error would be uh, talking about Jacob there, not uh, Christ in that one. So let's just stop there and we'll uh, continue on the next uh, video. Uh, might... Uh, I'll have at least uh, two, and then we'll get back to the New Testament in context and scroll down. We really only got to go to about uh, chapter three. I think I can make all the points about the New Testament connecting to the old in that small amount of time. So uh, next video will then will be uh, video eight. Thanks.